Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel. The text is Acts chapter 26, verses 22 through 32. The Reverend Dr. John Sias is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the 26th chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. And Paul said, To this day I have had the help that comes from God, And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the firstborn to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul stands before Portius Festus, the Roman procurator, and Herod Agrippa, the so-said king of the Jews, two perplexed politicians, each finding a self-serving way through, literally, a post-apocalyptic mess. For in their little dominion, the real king of the Jews has been crucified and has risen, and death, the strong arm of men with more power than they have authority, has thus been put to open shame. The Christ, having come forth alive, not as a fluke, but as the firstborn of the many from the dead. The Lord reigns, the Christ high ascended, and gathers his grain in from the four corners into his granary, and powerful men are left to fight to the death over the husks. Paul's in chains, yes, and these men sit for now on thrones and judgment seats, But Paul has, even here, the upper hand. For what Paul has compared to these little men? When he says, to this day I have had the help that comes from God, his Greek is a little obscure to us, uncommon, but it's clear enough to these two Roman-educated men. What he says is something more like this, that his fortune as the Romans thought of it, is pinned on the divine reinforcements. That where Paul is, there are the heavenly hosts, the Sabaoth, the the full power of God to act. And so Paul stands. He is a man, to be sure, who can and even will be put to death. And yet in this world, by this help, Even as a mere man, he is, and he lives, even in chains, a fullness of life at which even these great men, at which even Caesar himself, can only bitterly pretend. For it is no longer Paul who lives, but Christ who lives in him. And the life he now lives in the flesh, he lives by faith in this Son of God, who loved him and gave himself for him. And he will not nullify this grace of God. For us in this text, then, there are three things. 
what Paul believes, what Paul does, and how it's taken. First, what he believes. He believes the resurrection of the dead, of the Christ, bodily, from his death for the sins of the world, and therefore for all who live and die believing in him. But this is to Paul more than one checklist item in a law of things to be believed. It is the gospel the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the point on which his understanding of all things turns. For if the dead in Christ are raised, nothing is any more the same. He says along these lines an interesting thing here, which teaches us to read the Bible at a level to which we may not have attained. For not only the prophets, he says, and we go to Isaiah naturally, and not only the prophets, he says, proclaim that the Christ must suffer and be the first to rise from the dead, but also and emphatically Moses says this. Now we struggle to read this in Moses, I think. My study Bible has not a single reference to Moses there. But Paul does not, and we shouldn't either. Paul is not, as Festus says, made mad by his great learning. He is working from the facts of God. He has the mind of Christ. Maybe the connection is something as simple as that when Moses says in Deuteronomy 18.15 that the Lord will raise up a prophet like Moses to whom they will listen. Moses uses there for raise up the word we know as resurrect. That little glint seems to us we might pass over. Maybe it's happenstance, but it is the very word. Is it mad to connect this bit of Moses to the resurrection, to the ascension of Jesus, to the believing of his word, not only by his people, but by the nations? Hardly, I should think. But it's a stretch yet for us. We hem and haw. Could Moses have meant that all those years ago? Not only do we think about Moses and the Bible, but what of life? And how many glints of death, and now we have enough, do we quickly pass over the death of Jesus? And how many resurrections do we hope for that are not the one in him? Could it all be meant to point us to that alone? Now we're tracking Paul. The death and resurrection of Jesus and with him of all believers is the interpretive key. Not only to the Bible, all of it, but to all of life. It is to be the means by which we understand everything that has been and now is and must be. And this impacts, then, what Paul does and what is given also to us whose faith is in this Christ, to do now. He does not believe only, but he lives as one who believes. That is, in this transitory time, to live as those who will never die. To live, therefore, for others and not for ourselves. To love even those who do not believe or love as we do. For in truth, they are the ones who need life in this world to go on, that they may hear and believe. And in this love he acts. When he should, to all earthly sense for his own good, be silent, he speaks. He speaks, and King Agrippa gets the point of his speech. Would you in so little time persuade me to be a Christian? (laughs) Had Paul shut his trap some time ago, there was enough unwritten religious freedom to keep him quietly alive and probably at peace somewhere. But as with all freedom, the point of such religious freedom as you have is not that you can live in peace with what is in your heart alone. For the freedom to believe in the heart cannot be taken away. But the point of freedom is that you practice your faith before others, Christ being the light to all people. And what small men don't realize is that your freedom doesn't come from their documents or proclamations, but from the resurrection of the dead. 
Not that this freedom is for you, mind you, to do as you please. For that is not really freedom, to be a slave again to what you think you need. But the way Paul is free, you are free. Because Christ is risen, never to die again. And you Christians live in him, and this is the key to all. For just as the righteous by faith shall live, so also the righteous shall really live by faith. Finally, there is how this is taken in this life, what Paul believes and what he does, and us too. Festus thinks him mad. Agrippa says, maybe sympathetically, maybe not, poor chap, if only he'd worked within our system, we could have set him free. But here he's gone and appealed to Caesar, so to Rome with him. As with Paul, so with us. To live as those who will never die, simply by faith in the death of Jesus for our sins and in the already now resurrection to new life, to which our bodies will at the last surely catch up from wherever they have been expended and laid to rest. This stuff is a profound mystery to all the little men who have no more hope nor more fortune than they can amass in this world or ascribe to good chance. These guys may wish they could have set Paul free or not, but... With or without them, Paul is freer than they could ever imagine. As so, our politicians find their way through a post- or mid-apocalyptic mess. You, my Christian friends, are free. Not free for you, but free in Christ for them. And may our believing, our doing, our speaking, despite how it may be taken, be it as it was, as Paul's was. May it all be as Paul's was. And would to God that all who hear us might become as we are, with him. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Chapel. Today we pray for Chaplain Timothy Rosenthal, who is deployed. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces, visit kfuo.org chapel.